This presentation looks at classical and Keynesian macroanalysis. The classical model was the first attempt to explain the determinants of the price level, national levels of real GDP, employment, consumption, saving, and investment. Classical economists did most of their writing from the 1770s to the 1930s. They assumed that wages and prices were flexible and that competitive markets existed throughout the economy. Say's law states that supply creates its own demand, as producing goods and services generates the means and the willingness to purchase other goods and services. Or, supply creates its own demand, hence it follows that desired expenditures will equal actual expenditures. This circular flow follows like this. Output is the creation of supply of goods and services, which leads to income, which creates a demand for goods and services, which rolls back to output. The classical model assumes that pure competition exists, wages and prices are flexible, people are motivated by self-interest, and people cannot be fooled by money illusion. Money illusion is reacting to changes in money prices rather than relative prices. For instance, if a worker's wages double, and they think they're better off despite the fact that price levels also double, that worker is suffering from money illusion. If the role of government in the economy is minimal, pure competition prevails and all prices and wages are flexible, and if people are self-interested and do not experience money illusion, then the problems in the macro economy will be temporary and the market will correct itself. When income is saved, it is not reflected in product demand, so we can see it as a type of leakage in the circular flow of income and output, because saving withdraws funds from the income stream. So, total planned consumption spending can fall short of total current real GDP. Classical economist assumes that each dollar saved would be matched by business investment, uh, so the leakages would actually equal the injections, and equilibrium would exist at the price or interest rate of credit. In this graph, we can see that the equilibrium interest rate leads to a point where desired savings and desired investment are equal. While changes in saving and investment create a surplus or shortage in the short run, in the long run, just like with any short surplus or shortage, the price, or interest rate in this case, will adjust and bring the market back to equilibrium. So would unemployment be a problem in the classical model? No, classical economists assumed that wages would always adjust to the full employment level. In this graph, we see that the equilibrium wage rate should lead to an equilibrium level where supplied labor is exactly equal to demanded labor. The classical model suggests that long-term unemployment is impossible. Say's law, as well as flexible interest rates, prices, and wages, would tend to keep workers fully employed. So the long-run aggregate supply curve is vertical. Any change in aggregate demand will cause a change in the price level. Here we can see a visual representation of that, where the long-run aggregate supply curve is vertical. Any shift in aggregate demand just increases the price level. The effects the classical model assumes would happen due to a decrease in aggregate demand go as follows. With the economy at full employment, a decrease in aggregate demand leads to a fall in real GDP, and this is represented by the position of the long-run aggregate supply curve, which leads to an increase in unemployment, then competition among workers who are out of jobs and workers who are in jobs pushes down wage rates, and the same occurs for other input prices, which leads the economy back to equilibrium on its long-run aggregate supply curve. The classical, economists, the classical economists viewed the world as one with fully re utilized resources. However, in the 1930s, Europe and the United States entered a period of economic decline that couldn't be explained with a classical model. Enter John Maynard Keynes, who developed an explanation that has become known as the Keynesian model. His model argued that prices, including wages, are inflexible or sticky downward. An increase in aggregate demand will not raise the price level, and a decrease in aggregate demand will not cause firms to lower the price level. A Keynesian short-run aggregate supply curve 
is the horizontal portion of the aggregate supply curve in which there is excessive unemployment and unused capacity in the economy. Here we see why the flatness of the short-run aggregate supply curve in the Keynesian model leads to shortages and surpluses. If aggregate demand shifts outward, then our quantity demanded in real GDP increases, but because there's no change in price level, given the short-run aggregate supply curve, there is no change in output. The opposite is true of a decreased aggregate demand supply. Keynes argued that in a depressed economy, increased aggregate spending can increase output without raising prices. Data showing the U.S. recovery from the Great Depression seem to bear this out. In such circumstances, real GDP is demand-driven, as the short-run aggregate supply curve was almost flat. The Keynesian model suggests that equilibrium GDP is demand-determined. Short-run aggregate supply schedule shows sources of price rigidities. Union and long-term contracts explain inflexibility of nominal wage rates. The underlying assumption of the model is that the relevant range of the short-run aggregate supply schedule is horizontal. However, the price level has drifted up in recent decades, so prices are not totally sticky. Modern Keynesian analysis recognizes that some, but not complete, price adjustment takes place in the short run. The short run aggregate supply curve shows the relationship between total planned economy-wide production and the price level in the short run, all other things held constant. If prices adjust incompletely in the short run, the curve is positively slow. In panel A, we see the traditional Keynesian analysis with a completely flat short run aggregate supply curve. In panel B, we see modern analysis where Price level shifts up some, but it doesn't shift all the way to where it should in equilibrium with the long-run aggregate supply curve. In the modern model, the price level rises partially, so real GDP can expand beyond the level consistent with its long-run growth path. This occurs because most labor contracts allow for flexibility in the total number of work hours. The existing capital stock can be used more intensely and wages are constant when prices rise, so a firm is more profitable in its operations. These adjustments cause real GDP to rise with the price level. Firms use workers more intensively. They get workers to work harder. Existing capital equipment is used more intensively. They use the machines for longer hours. And wage rates are held constant and a higher price level leads to increased profits, which leads to lower unemployment as firms hire more. In both aggregate demand and aggregate supply curves, non-price level factors call shifts. Any change in the endowments of the factors of production, that is, more labor or capital, can shift both short and long-run aggregate supply. However, changes such as production input prices, particularly those caused by temporary external events, only shift the short-run aggregate supply curve. This table discusses some of the causes for changes in aggregate supply. An aggregate demand shock is any event that causes the aggregate demand curve to shift inward or outward. Similarly, an aggregate supply shock is just an event that causes aggregate supply to shift inward or outward. A recessionary gap is the gap that exists whenever equilibrium real GDP per year is less than full employment real GDP, as shown by the position of the long-run aggregate supply curve. Here we see that when our aggregate demand shifts in, in the short run, our aggregate supply pushes the price level down, and our real GDP shifts, and we have a recessionary gap from what it should be in the long run to what it is currently in the short run. An inflationary gap is what happens in the opposite event. When aggregate demand shifts outwards or increases, we have an increase in the price level along the short-run aggregate supply curve, as well as an increase in real GDP per year. However, in the long run, it should contract back to the long-run aggregate supply levels. And so what we expect to have in the long run and what we have in the short run is where we find the inflationary gap. In a growing economy, the explanation for persistent inflation is that aggregate demand rises over time at a faster pace than the full employment level of real GDP.
Short run variations in inflation, however, can arise as a result of both demand and supply factors. Demand pool inflation is inflation caused by increases in aggregate demand that aren't matched by increases in aggregate supply. Cost push inflation is inflation caused by decreases in short run aggregate supply. Here we see cost push inflation, where the short run aggregate supply has decreased, sliding the equilibrium price level up higher along the aggregate demand curve. The open economy is one of the reasons aggregate demand slopes downward. When the domestic price level rises, U.S. residents want to buy cheaper priced foreign goods. The opposite occurs when the U.S. domestic price level falls. When the dollar becomes weaker against other world currencies, it causes a shift inward to the left in the short-run aggregate supply curve, causing equilibrium real GDP to fall and, call and price levels to rise. This tends to cause employment to decrease and it contributes to inflation. In a real world example of a shift inward of short run aggregate supply, assume the United States has experienced a drought. The drought reduced the nation's water resources for farm production, electric power generation, and water transportation, so the U.S. short run aggregate supply has reduced.